Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. I have spent better than four decades working in the game of hockey, fortunate enough to meet some legends of the game, saw them come into the league, shine in the game, uh, go into the Hall of Fame, and now move on to life after hockey. This podcast gives me a chance to, to call up, say hello, tell some stories, relive some great memories with some of the greats in the game today. The man who helped build one of the greatest dynasties in NHL history. He snapped Bobby Orr's eight-year run of consecutive <laughs> Norris trophies. The first D-man in NHL history to hit a 1,000 points for his career. Four-time Stanley Cup champion, Hockey Hall of Famer, Denny Pavet. Denny, welcome. It is so great to catch up with you again, my friend. You know, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm not much involved in hockey, but when I get an opportunity like this, I really jump at it. So for, thanks for inviting me. You know what? Here's what struck me as I was kind of thinking back on your career. I was thinking back on a theme with you about all the transitions that happened mm -hmm. as part of your career. I mean, for, for the younger hockey fan who maybe not may not know this, you stepped in the New York Islander organization one year after they were an expansion team. And, and it was yeah. like, oh, my gosh, what is this poor guy stepping into? You stepped mm -hmm. into an era – where where Bobby Orr was the man on the blue line yeah. Uh, yeah. for for many years to come. You stepped into an era where it the there was no such thing as a Rangers Islanders rivalry because the Islanders were awful, <laughs> and so right. there was no rivalry. And yet you saw transitions with that rivalry. You saw transitions with your game doing some things that even Bobby Orr had never done. Um, so I want to talk to you about the, the those transitions because you were just a humble guy from Hull slash Ottawa with the 67s. What was that like to be thrust into New York as a young kid? Well, I'd never seen, uh, like, you know, I think most kids uh, growing up in Ottawa and Banier, uh, we didn't know what New York even looked like. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, will, <laughs> I will say exactly what Al Arbor said when he first came to coach in 1973. And by the way, that's one of the big building pieces right there. I couldn't believe it. Coincidentally, you guys both joined the team at the same time. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like in 1973, yeah. uh, it's part of the, the reason why Bill Torrey, I believe, was uh, called the architect, yeah. you know, as he's been retired uh, both in, in the building and in the Hall of Fame. But just to kind of give an idea of what it was like, I showed up in a limousine <laughs> because the NHL was doing a commercial with Coca-Cola. They dropped me off at the uh, at the Plaza Hotel, Midtown Manhattan. And Gino, I walked, I got out of the limo with a pair of shorts and a cutoff shirt. Oh my God. That's spectacular. <laughs> so it was one of the very first humbling oh. moments I had when I got to New York. We did the commercial, everything was great. But uh, to your question, uh, there are several things that are very, very key. First of all, uh, Bill Torrey went out and got Al Arbor. Yeah. And, and that was an incredible transition. And Bill has said later, uh, he said, the, one of the big reasons why I needed a guy like Al Arbor is because we needed to learn how to play defense. Yeah. Throughout my 15-year career in the NHL, starting in 73, Al Arbor, you know, my first coach in the NHL, he impressed upon me, knowing that I was an offensive defenseman. Yeah. You know, hopefully being able, being able to combine both, right? But I had a great yeah. last junior year in Ottawa with the 67s. He said, Dennis, he said, look, if you're in good position defensively, you'll be in good position offensively. Yeah. And when people kind of say, well, what does he mean? I say, take a look at Hedman the yeah. wonderful defenseman for the yeah. Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah. You know, he doesn't do it like Bobby Orr or Paul Coffey or even me at times, you know, rushing all the way up the ice. He does it every now and then. But he's the guy that I look today and I say, you know what? I think he heard that comment somewhere along the way. Because whether it's on a power play, penalty killing, even in the offensive zone, you've got to be the responsible guy. And um, so Hedman is... Uh, pretty much you know my poster guy for you know that kind of a comment that al gave me in the early beginnings uh and, and then uh and then i've got to i've got to certainly go to bill tory making a trade for my brother jean yeah 
Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Gino, 1972, the World Hockey League came in. I yeah. was getting a lot of offers because there was, you know, talk about me being high in the draft, even as high as number one. And the Chicago Cougars had my rights. Pat Stapleton, yeah. uh, who was involved with that team. I, I, I looked at it. I had my agents look at it at the time. But, you know, I wanted to go to the NHL. I mean, yeah. you know, I used to sit at, you know, I used to sit with a pizza and a Pepsi watching the Montreal Canadiens, you know, yeah. on Wednesday and and uh, Saturday and René Le Cavalier, you know, uh, <laughs> watching the Montreal Canadiens. I wanted yeah. to go to the NHL. But Bill wanted to make sure that I was going to go to the Islanders. And he made a trade. And he got my brother from Philly for Terry Crisp. Yeah. Well, there was no doubt at that, that point. That pretty much sealed it, yeah. Yeah, you had a chance to play with I, him for like eight years, right? I did, and plus we played Stanley together Cups. as juniors. We yeah. roomed together since I was about eleven years old in the basement of mom and dad's house. So yeah. uh, Patsy and I uh, were very, very close. Um, and still today, I think he's around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We lost him last year, along with Mike yeah. Bossy and Clark Gillies. It was a rough year for you, my friend. Yes, it was a very, very rough year, and. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not self-promoting, but uh, I am getting involved with uh, University of Pennsylvania, and we talk about cancer. You know, we've all been touched by it. Everybody's, yeah. you know, been touched by it in some way. We lost my dad to cancer as well in 1984, right during those playoffs. Yeah. Um, so I'm involved with uh, University of Pen Pennsylvania, and uh, I'm going to say it: um, uh, we are trying to bring the very first proton therapy cancer treatment to Canada. Wow. Uh, there are about there are about 38 of those centers in the United States. Canadians who need proton therapy have to go to the US to get the treatment. Yeah. Anyway, I don't need to go into a long time. People don't know about it, just Google it. Proton therapy is really very exciting. And uh, I'm involved with a group, including University of Pennsylvania, world renowned in uh, proton therapy to uh, bring the very first center to Canada. Right now we're, you know, we're eyeing Edmonton. Yeah. Danny, I'll yeah. tell you what, man, there's not a single one of us who hasn't been touched by cancer, either right. directly ourselves or, or somebody that, that we love and care for. So anything you can do on that front would be spectacular. Oh, do you ever wonder good. about how things could have been different if not for a single decision? You mentioned Bill Torrey. One of my favorite stories was at the draft when you were taken, like seconds after you were taken, a conversation yeah. between Torrey and Sam Pollock, the GM of the Montreal Canadiens. Recount that story for us. Well, you know, you know, I had played almost five years of junior hockey because I started, actually, yeah. some of my first games were not season games or the 67s, but, you know, in, in 68, uh, after the uh, the 67s not making the playoffs, I joined the team for a few exhibition games. Yeah. You know, we went out to Moose Jaw and went out to Halifax, played those uh, junior teams. I didn't want... Uh, I didn't want to go anywhere but the NHL. And um, the bottom line was, I, I was born as all my family. We're all Montreal Canadiens fans. Yeah. To this day, I've always said the same thing. And I got, I'm really blessed to have met the man. Jean Beliveau was my idol. He was my idol, my friend. Yeah. When Sam Pollock in the 1973 draft, <laughs> and this is a story told to me by Bill Torrey. Yeah. He took Bill Torrey around the building, you know, the city, what was it, the Queen Elizabeth, I think, the Queen Elizabeth, or, yeah. or maybe the Royal York. I can't remember exactly where the draft was, but a big city block. And apparently, according to Bill Torrey, Sam Pollock took him around and offered him a player each time from the Stanley <laughs> Cup lap. Montreal Canadiens team. Yeah. <laughs> so Sam Pollock, in the end, offered five players. Yeah. And Bill kept saying no. So Mr. Campbell has the gavel. And he's ready to start the draft in 1973. And just as he's about to land it, and I remember this vividly because it was as a life of them, Sam Pollock walks across the room. Mr. Campbell, may I have a moment, please? He came over to Bill Torrey one more time. <laughs> and I'm sitting at the, at the table with the Islanders, and I see just Bill shake his head. And he said, I guess he, he just said no, but I, could, I got the message. Sam Pollock turned around, went back to the Montreal Canadiens table, and you know, Mr. Uh, you know, the uh, Mr. Clarence Campbell, uh, boom. He said, okay, New York Islanders, 
you are first to pick and yeah. they picked me. That so that, that was, that was it. And I'll tell you why I had been a great fan and I played against, you know, I played against Guy Lafleur since we were like 11, 12 years yeah. old. They put him in Halifax for like a year and a half. Larry <laughs> Robinson. Went well, to because Halifax. there's so much talent there. So I had played five years junior and I kind of said to myself, I'd be damned if I'm going to go to the minor leagues. <laughs> and fortunately, everything I really wanted to play with my brother, to, to be on a team that would put me on the ice, you know, right away, uh, the Islanders offered it all. So uh, that's how that all went. And my motivation was for, you know, going to the Islanders and thankful in many ways that it wasn't Sam Pollock who won yeah. that argument. <laughs> no, well, no kidding, because now you step in. Well, I mean, I, I you can understand your trepidation, New York City, yeah. big city. Not only that, but from a franchise standpoint, you could step into the Habs organization and realistically think in your head, we could win this year. No problem. We could win the Stanley yeah. Cup this year. True. Instead, yeah. you're you're looking at, okay, now I'm going to an, island, an expansion team that's only been around for a year. They're horrible. <laughs> Al Arbor wasn't there at that point yet. Right. So 12 wins, yeah, 12 yeah. victories. But then yeah. you step in and you win the Calder. You win Rookie of the yeah. Year. And then just three years later, like you're in a league now where Bobby Orr is at his prime. He's spectacular. You're stepping yeah. in. You're an offensive defense, and the comparisons start right away. And then in the 75-76 season, you end Bobby Orr's streak of eight straight Norris trophies. I know you've got a bit of an edge, and I know that you've got that mentality like, why not me? I get it. But when it actually happened, did you go, holy crap, this really happened? I was sitting in my parents' uh, kitchen when the phone rang and my father picked it up. Uh, and you know how he picks up the phone and then turns around and looks yeah. at you and I'm going, yeah. <laughs> he, he says, yes, Mr. Torrey, he'll be there. <laughs> Bill Torrey, I guess, said to my dad, uh, please make sure Dennis comes to Montreal to collect his hardware. That's how that's how you found out you won the Norris. That's how I found out. He didn't even tell you you found out from your dad. <laughs> well, I guess that you know there's a voting process, <laughs> yeah. You know, and we had that's the only year um where we didn't make the playoffs. Yeah. Or did we? No, I think you did. I think you made the that the, we made the yeah. playoffs. Yeah, yeah. And you know, l listen, you know, I think it's been well documented. I came in with a lot of confidence, but Confidence is what really builds up a lot of athletes. And I needed, you know, as much confidence in my play and in myself that when I stepped on the ice and the world was mine to play hockey as yeah. well or sometimes as bad as I as I could, I wanted to have a lot of that confidence going in. Uh, it wasn't a competition. It's very important to understand that because at 14 years old, when I played my first game against the Niagara Falls Flyers in Ottawa, for the Ottawa 67s, the next day, the Ottawa newspapers had Dennis Potvin, the next Bobby Orr. I know. It started oh, early, on. man. Oh, come on, man. I mean, <laughs> I mean, say LaPierre, say Casey yeah. Tremblay, say Leo Boyvin, say whoever you want, but yeah. don't make me compared to Bobby Orr at 14. And I really did have to answer those questions. And you know how reporters can be, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did, did I hear you say you were better than Bobby Orr, you know, and stuff like that? Well, yeah. it was never that kind of competition. So in any event, I, I, I established a goal where I led the team, the Islanders, in scoring the first year and yeah. also did the next three years. Yes, so you did. I believe, you know, I'm still the only defenseman to have led their team in scoring the first four years that that defenseman was in the league. So that was a major goal to help bring the team to another level and to bring my game to that level where eventually in 76, I won the Calder. You won the, you won the Calder. You won I'm sorry, the Norris. The Norris. Yeah. yeah. The Norris. You won it again yeah. in 78. You won it again in yeah. 79. You won it three, three times over that five year stretch, which was amazing. And then the 78, 79 season, when you won your, your third Norris, you became just the second defenseman in NHL history with a hundred points. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the first one was Bobby Orr. What was it like? I mean, you had hovered right around a hundred, but that year you hit a hundred points. What was it like? Because that was always the standard, right? 50 goals, hundred points as a defenseman. That was insane. I still have the puck, you know, 
<laughs> well, you don't tell anybody where it is, brother. No, but all your memorabilia people, I still have yeah. the puck. Anyway, um, it was a buildup, just like our team. Now, if I can, if I can just talk about Bill Torrey, Jimmy Devolano, who you know very well, legend, legend, still is today, and a great friend. Uh, I mean, he's with Detroit. So the drafting went this way. Billy Harris, mm-hmm. one of the great junior players, yep. Yep. good friend today. Then I came along. Then there was Clark Gillies. Yep. Then there's Brian Trottier. The Hall then, of Famers just had Trottier in the show a little while ago. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and then Mike Bossy. Bing, bing, bing. Four years in a row. And we already had Billy Smith. Yeah. So the drafting was incredible. Yeah. So when I say a buildup, we were good. You remember the Montreal Canadiens went on to win four straight. But I believe, and again, somebody would have to check that, the New York Islanders may have been one of the only or few teams that ever won a game in playoff hockey against the Montreal Canadiens during their reign of yeah. four Stanley Cups. Yeah. So we were up and coming. So by the Absolutely. time I got to that level of scoring, you know, a hundred points. But you were a big it, part of the up and coming. Don't make it sound like you happen to be riding the coattails of other people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you get in the face-off circle, you tell Brian Trache, Trach, give me the puck. And then yeah. you look over at Bussy and he's looking at you. There's a play there. Yeah, and yeah, there is. The guy who starts it is that wonderful centerman. But yeah. uh, no, listen, I, I, I certainly was continuing to improve. Not only that, but from the first year Al Arbor coach, remember I said that I, uh, Bill Torrey brought him in to play de- uh, to teach defense. From the first year I was there, 73, 74, to the very next year, we cut our goals against by exactly 100. That's insane. I don't think that will ever be done. That's insane. Insane. So yeah. he taught us, and then, by the way, that 75 season was a real breakthrough yeah. as we beat the Rangers in the playoffs. And, you know, you can imagine the Coliseum in Long Island was about 80% Ranger fans in the beginning. I, I remember Rod Gilbert, And just dare to mock you more than anything else. <laughs> I remember Rod Gilbert, a, a lifelong friend. Of course, we, we lost him too uh, recently, scoring, uh, I believe, he's the first goal. And again, you know, I'm not looking at stats or anything. But scoring a goal in the, the Coliseum, the building erupts. And we go back to the dressing room, and Bobby Nystrom, old Bobby, is just incensed. He is just so mad. Yeah. Of course, you know, he's our leader in emotion kind of thing throughout, you know, all the years Bobby played. So we were able to win back many of those fans. And figuratively, they were taking off the Ranger jerseys and putting yeah. on Islander jerseys. So that's the buildup I was talking about. But that's what I'm talking time. about, the transition. You you yeah. you were a part of an incredible transition in yeah. one of the biggest cities, one of the biggest markets of all of sport, not just hockey, but of all of sport. Yeah. I mean, you're also, let's face it, the the catalyst, maybe a part yeah, of yeah. one of the biggest yeah. rivalries. I mean, do you mind if I tell the Alf Nelson story? Is that okay? Are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah, but stay on the catalyst thing. I like that. Okay, Keep good. Going good. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just well, want to tell you, you know, in preparation, I watched last night for two hours. The 1980 game one of the Stanley Cup finals in Philadelphia. And Bob Cole, what great broadcast. The best. I'll tell you the next one's going to be a big one. And Bob Cole said, what's going to determine this playoff series? They're going to be tough. They're going to be physical. All that stuff. Both teams brought a lot. But he said power plays. And you know that we scored 15 power play goals in six games against the Flyers in 1980 to win the cup, a huge catalyst to use your word in, in bringing us the cup that year. All right. So I'll talk yeah, about the rivalry talk- in a second. You want me to stall on the thing? So I'll talk about the catalyst thing. You were uh, in, we're in conversation with hockey hall of famer, Dennis Bob Van, <laughs> the first defenseman ever to reach a thousand career points, which was, I mean, insane. Absolutely insane, especially <laughs> in that era. No one ever, ever considered that that was ever going to happen. Let's let's stay down the road of you being the catalyst then. So now you you win your your Norrises. You've now got three Norrises. 
you've hit your hundred point season. You've ended yeah. Bobby Orr's streak of winning the Norris's seven years into your NHL career. They hand you the C you're yeah. going into the 79, 80 season and they hand you the C. And at that point, you guys just went to an entirely different level. And it was the beginning of something that I don't know. I mean, the Habs are the Habs with their their consecutive mm -hmm. cups. I get it. That's amazing. But they were an original six team. They were around for years and years and years, way before, like 70 years before you yeah. guys were even thought of. Eight years after you guys dropped the puck as an organization, seven years after you joined the team, you get to see, and now you go into a Stanley Cup winning season and the mm -hmm. dynasty is born. What was there? Was there a moment getting back to your idea of being a catalyst? Was there a moment where things just clicked and you said, we're ready. We can do this. Well, uh, it probably didn't have as much to do with the progression of the team as it did. I want to be Jean Beliveau. I want to yeah. see that Stanley cup as yeah. captain <clears throat> and, uh, there was, you know, obviously management, Bill Torrey, Al Arbor, and whoever else, you know, they made the decision and brought me in and said, look, you know, we'd like to be captain. Will you accept it? I nearly went through the roof. I yeah, said, no yes. kidding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You're the and first I, guy to get the cup, baby. <laughs> well, you know what? It, it, it's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And, you, you know, you have to understand that it was a different era. You know, there were 16 of us that are engraved on four stanley cups it wasn't a lot of change yeah. you know except for one player or two so now it's a question of okay what is leadership all about what does it mean i gotta tell you bill tory handed me a book with bobby clark on on the cover that's hilarious and said, yeah and it said the captains yeah and i thought you know who better than bobby clark right yeah. through the early 70s uh but anyway my challenge was you know, because I talked to the media a lot. I was very comfortable yeah. on camera, things of that nature. That's part of being captain. So that was one of the things that worked well. But, I mean, am I going to be Newt Rockney? Am I going to go rah, rah, rah in the yeah, dressing yeah. room? And I said to myself, you know what? If, if I can say nothing in the dressing room, but have a great first shift. Yeah. And a lot of it, in my mind, you know how I played. Yeah. No it, one ever looked might, at you on the ice and said, I wonder if he's just dragging his butt around the ice. No one, that's <laughs> never been uttered about you. But, you know, that first shift to me on the ice, and fortunately, you know, Al had me to start the game, you know, most nights. That was so important. And a lot of it had to do with who can I hit? Yeah. And I hit LaFleur <laughs> and I hit Peter Stastny and I hit McLeish and I was able to get them. And a first shift like that not only got me going, but I think that was part of how I envisioned leadership. Go out and do it, and they will follow. Because by 79, we're the best team in the NHL Absolutely. during the season yeah. in the point total. So it wasn't a far stretch to know that, yes, I'm carrying the C, but there's got to be six. And where I look, there's six or seven yeah. leaders in the yeah. dressing room. So uh, it, it's very different than maybe people's perception of what a captain is. You know, he is going to take some some responsibility, but he's not alone. You know, yeah, he, he, no. and especially on our team. We were, especially on that team where you guys had yeah, so many yeah. Hall of Famers. Loaded. It was insane. Yeah. yeah. So you go on to win. You win your first cup in 80, then 81, 82. Yeah. <laughs> like it just you go four straight Stanley Cups, which is unheard of. Unheard of. Like, I mean, especially now in the cap world oh, is yeah. never going to happen again free so it's agency. Not now. yeah yeah free agency but, as well yeah, yeah to have hap to have it happen on a young organization that you guys did was i don't know it was it was mind-boggling to me and then and then the transition in, in in the cup with the oilers um in 1983 could i uh, lead you into where you want to go you did you were perfect you were perfect at that. it didn't Talk suck no it didn't suck it didn't suck okay so for for maybe the one percent of the audience out there who doesn't know the story, so <laughs> we're, we're nineteen. I, I remember, Danny. I remember the the first time I was at MSG for a game. I was a kid. I was young. I don't remember how, how old I was. And all of a sudden, they start chanting "Pop Vance sucks." I'm like, 
The guy's been retired for for a while now. What the heck yeah. is this all about? It's that they're not on the ice. They're not playing. I don't get it. Right. So just to backtrack on the story, and I, I knew how it all started. I just didn't realize that it was continuing. Back in February 1979 at MSG, you you talked about the fact you hit everything, which rightfully so. That's what you got to do. Yeah, the example. yeah. It was a rough incident with Altness, and you hit him. The skate got his skate got caught in a rut, ended up breaking right. his ankle. And even to this day, he says he doesn't blame you at all for that. Not That's at right. all, but it happens at MSG. You're right. an Islander. You're yeah. a legendary Islander. So, you know, you're going to get some pushback. And that was the start of yeah. the chant yeah. that to this day continues. What was that like at that point? And at what point were you finally like, okay, I'm okay with it now. Did, did it ever hit a point with that? Oh, it took many, many years. For sure. When I walked into Madison square garden, uh, to broadcast a game with Fox Sports for the Florida Panthers. Uh, well, I was uh, with the Panthers for over 20 years. Um, John Davidson did something that was very thoughtful and, and gra- I was grateful for it. Madison Square Garden at that time, Gino, you'll remember that the the, the box level where we broadcast from was two-tier. Yeah. yeah. Well, because one- apparently the rumor was they forgot to build a a press box at MSG and they had to insert it in there. Well, whatever it yeah. was, yeah. the visiting team would sit below John, you know, JD yeah. uh, as broadcast location, yeah. but you were at the same level as an, a, a row of seats right in front yeah. of you. Yeah. So there was this, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but there was this big Irish cop <laughs> that came from Long Island and I think he may have been an Islander fan, but, you know, I, I, he saw that there's a little bit of fear in my eye. I don't know what's yeah. going to happen. You know, they could come at me. And well, one night, one guy almost did, but I was, I was going to jump at him. John Davidson said, look, come on up with us. And from that point on, whenever I broadcast in Madison Square Garden, I could hear the chants and they were louder and louder yeah. as the game went on. But I was sitting in a very protected area, thanks to John Davidson, on the second level, you know, uh, of the uh, broadcast location. Um, but so it went on for a long, long time. Um, I'll take a moment if you don't mind. Again. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, again. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> for those of you who are listening and aren't actually watching, that De- has started, I guess, back in October, right? Just a couple of months ago. Well, obviously After... it started earlier, but the launch was October 26th against the Rangers. Yeah. At the UBS Arena. The, there that's a line of socks right now that are that are called Pod Van Socks, playing that's with right. the Pod Van Socks, which I think is hilarious. And oh, it, yeah. and I think it kind of shows us all as hockey fans that you're now past that. That right. that that's... it's now like, hey, it's a part of the game, you're past it. Is that fair? That that answers your question. Yeah. You know, how long did it take? And it took 43 years of yeah. listening to the chant. But if you go to potpinsocks.com, <laughs> I have a little video there and it kind of tells the whole story, you know. Yeah. But the bottom line is, you know, the, the idea came to me many years ago, but all I had to do was change one letter. Yeah, that's it. And it works. <laughs> but I never found the connection. Now I have a partner, Jim Lyman, out of Connecticut who's a manufacturer of boxing equipment. Yeah. And he says, I can do that. I could do socks for you. So that's how it all started. That's and uh, it's going very, very well. And I'm going back to Long Island for, I guess, three more dates before the end of the season. And uh, they, they, the Islanders have been unbelievable. They've been great. They yeah. set up a little platform. I go out there with a couple of dozen socks, pairs, and I throw them up into the crowd. <laughs> It's a lot of fun. It's a lot That's of fun. perfect. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, you, you mentioned briefly, Bossy. I mean, you had some legends on your game. Brian, Trot, yeah. Brian Trotje just joined us, Hall of Famer, Mike Bossy. Uh, Bossy's career ended way too soon, obviously. Oh, boy. He ended yeah. at, at 31 years old. He was a legend. I want to run some numbers by you, and I want to get your opinion as a guy who played with Bossy, as a guy yes. who played against Gretzky, and as a guy who's watched as a broadcaster for years, Alexander Ovechkin. So Gretzky's yeah. number one on the goals list, 894 um, in 487 games. Did the math. He scores 0.6 goals per game during his career. Jeez. Ovi, 809. Um, 
well, at the time as of recording this, 809. He right. he actually scored a slightly faster pace at 0. 0.61 goals per game. Then there's Mike Bossy, your old teammate. Yeah. He won four yeah. Stanley Cups with this guy, and his career ended way too soon. Yeah. He scored 573 goals, but only 752 games. That's 0. 0.76 goals per game. It's not even close. It's wow. such a, a higher pace than both Ovi and Wayne. Okay, so here's the question. You played against Wayne. You had to try to defend against yeah, him. Yeah, you had played yeah. in cup finals against him. You've watched Ovi. You played with Bossy. Who's right. the greatest goal scorer of all time? Is that too much to put on you? You know what? I, it's an easy answer. First of all, the brilliance of all three makes them totally different. Yeah. And you know, of course, Gretzky's brilliance and how he was able to get those goals. He was he was like a shadow on the ice. I mean, we couldn't find him, and all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, pucks in the net, and he's going, hey, you know. I used to love, Dennis, how people would say, why don't people just hit him? And I'm like, yeah, you know what you need to do is you need to ask somebody out there on the ice who's trying to hit him, and he'll explain that to you why. I tried. <laughs> I tried. I think I played 10 years against Gretz. You know, when we played like three playoffs against the Oilers, yeah. and of course, you know, we we did we won, but you know, they were they were twenty and twenty one years old. He and yeah. Mass, and you know, part of the other guys. But believe me, I tried to hit him. I tried to hit him. <laughs> but here's the scenario: put it in your head. So Al Arbor said, "Okay, you got to meet him at center ice." And I said, "Okay." But to watch Gratz, he would kind of leave his defensive zone early, usually move towards one of the side boards yeah. and then when the time was right he would try and cut across between yeah. his blue line and center ice well i knew that yeah. and you know whether whatever side he wanted to go on i was going as well yeah but just picture this i'm <laughs> i'm looking at i don't look at the puck of course any young defenseman knows you don't ever look at the puck in a situation like that so i'm coming in and i'm coming in i'm coming he passed the puck <laughs> So I was three or four feet from him. I really wanted to get in there, yeah. but I couldn't, you know, that would have been interference by then. Yeah. So how we dealt with that, particularly in 1983, was our wingers had to pick up Curry and Anderson and whoever was playing with Gretz coming through the neutral zone so he didn't have a passing target. Yeah. And my coming at Gretz, granted, I couldn't make total physical contact with him, but if I could just rush the pass and force just him to a make a bit, move, yeah. Have him move the puck before he really wanted to. And I think that when you look at the 83 finals, you know, winning it four straight, we yeah. did a hell of a job as a team controlling their offense that was already, you know, just magnificent. In fairness, the 83 team probably wasn't your best Islander team of mm. that dynasty, I wouldn't say. But yeah. was it the most satisfying win, the fact that you were able to do it with maybe at a time where, where the whole talent level on the team was a little lesser than it was in 81 well, and 82? Yeah. Well, we're older. You know, yeah. I think, you know, you look at the core of the Oilers in 83 and ours, it was probably a 10-year difference. Yeah. You know, they were sure. 23 and we were like 31, 32. Uh, so it, it was incredibly satisfying because I don't think in 83 anybody, thought we were going to win that the Stanley Cup. I mean, first of all, we're starting the first two games in Edmonton. And, you know, that in itself, I think the pundits, you know, nobody had us winning that series. Yeah. And then the first game of the 83 series, you know, we played without Mike Boss. Yeah. His boss had, I think, laryngitis or something, but he couldn't play. So when we went out on the ice, first game, Stanley Cup Finals, 1983, no Mike Bossy. So what are you thinking about? Defense, yeah. defense, defense. Yeah. And we ended up winning the game 2-0. Uh, and Kenny Morrow scored in the empty net to make it a 2-0 mm -hmm. win. Well, Billy Smith was like, that's why he's an Hall of Fame. That particular game, you know, in my That's view. it. Shut it down. So, so that's kind of how it went. Uh, and, and then the game was, the next game was 6-3 in Edmonton. And then we went on to win. But well, let me get back to the other guys. Um, Ovechkin, we talked about Gretzky. Yeah. I don't recall other than Brad Hull being similar in terms of 
Ovechkin knows where to be where you just can't get the stick yeah. in yeah. front of his shot. But I would not want to play against Ovechkin because he is aggressive. Yeah. And I thought to myself, how the hell would I stop a 235-pound yeah. guy that can really skate? He yeah. can stick handle, He can do it all. But I think his strength is his strength. And the fact that, you know, you can get close to him, but you can't stop him from shooting the puck. Of course, yeah. great teammates to move the puck. In Bossy's case, again, very different player. I watched the game last night, the 1980 Stanley Cup Finals, the first game. I'm watching Boss because I'm saying, you know, was he just an offensive guy? You know that Bossy would play defense perfectly. Like, for instance, the puck would come in our zone, and I saw myself go back to get the puck, and I'm watching Boss on the right boards. Do you know that he steps in front of the first four checker? Doesn't make contact. Yeah. Doesn't make contact. Just enough to pick. But all of a sudden, that four checker is in no man's zone. I come around the net, boss is up the right wing. Yeah. I mean, that's defense, you know. Yeah, and uh, nice. so boss had that plus terrific passing ability. But if you look at all three, of course, I'm biased, but I can be because I practice with them every day. Sure, you can. Yeah. That releases. I, I, nobody's ever over. Oh, yeah. I have still haven't seen anybody with that. I mean, McDavid is great, you know, and Bryce Seidel, a lot of great players, but that little boom, that release, yeah. that wrist action. You can be, listen, you can be biased because you was your teammate, but the, the bottom line is the numbers bear it out. Yeah. You know, the numbers, yeah, cool. yeah. The numbers show that. He yeah. retired at 31. If he doesn't, yeah. if he had to step away from the game because of injury at 31, if he, if he plays five more years or six more years, who knows what those numbers are like? We don't know. We don't know. But, uh, but on a pace, on a goals per game, no one was better in the history of the NHL. That's the bottom line. Listen, I've, I've loved telling all the stories and I've loved listening to all these things. And we're just about out of time and I appreciate all your time. But before we go, yeah, uh, something near and dear to my heart. You talked about bossy. We lost Mike this year. Yeah, we lost Clark yeah. Gillies this year. We also lost yeah. your brother. And yeah. as a guy who has a brother, um, it, it, it must've been very, very difficult. I know, um, he battled for many years, uh, yeah. the last few years with medical issues before he passed, yeah. you had an opportunity to play, I think what, eight years with him. You won two Stanley cups with him. Right. Yeah. 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 Take it, take a couple of moments just to, to express to us how significant that was to have that opportunity to share something like that with one of the most important people in your life. I think I can, I can do it with a heavy heart in about 30 seconds, you know. Uh, but, but see, he was my pillar. Yeah. When I was nine, 10 years old and dad had the backyard rink, Patsy would bring his friends over and he'd say, hey, Dan, he called me Dun, D-O-U-N-E. Hey, Dun. I don't know where the hell I got that. He said, come on out and play with us. All right, so already I'm nine, ten years old, playing against kids that are my brother's age, three and a half years older than me. I go to the uh, the 67s, Potsy's there. I played two years with Potsy in the with the uh, 67s. He gets drafted. A couple of things happen. He ends up with the L.A. Kings. Then he ends up with the Flyers. And as we mentioned earlier, the trade is made. Just as I walk in, a pillar. I mean. Yeah. Putsy and Lorraine would serve me dinner most every night or so yeah. many nights. Uh, he was my partner on defense. We established things together as defensemen. Do you know that in, I think it was 1975, Putsy and I were on the power play for the New York Islanders. And I, and I think together we scored 172 points. Yeah. Only one or two shy of Bobby and Dennis Hall yeah. as brothers from the back line. Patsy is the only defenseman in the history of the of the of the New York Islanders that scored more than seventy points in one season. That record is Patsy and me. They do it. So awesome. you talk about what I lost. I lost my best friend. Yeah, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you for for taking this time to share these stories yeah. with us. Thanks for reminiscing and looking back. Uh, 
I, I, I treasured watching you on the play and the entertainment and stuff that you brought us. And um, I just treasure what our relationship has developed to in your post career. And I wish you nothing but the best, my friend. I thank you so much for all that you did in the game and for the fact that you're continuing to willing to, to share these stories. I appreciate this. Thank you. You know, uh, I was looking forward to this and uh, you as a, uh, as a public person, personality, uh, I don't know who does it better. So thank you. You're too gracious. Thanks. Four time Stanley cup champion, three time Norris winner, hockey hall of famer, Dennis Bogdan. The Overtime Podcast is proudly presented by 7-Eleven. Before leaving the rink, order your favorite Slurpee, fresh 100% premium Arabica coffee, hot from the oven pizza and wings, pint of ice cream, or even a carton of milk, eggs, loaf of bread from the 7Now app, and Team 7-Eleven will have your order ready for pickup 24-7. If you missed any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at overtimepodcast.ca, where you can both listen and subscribe to future shows. 7-Eleven's Overtime Podcast can be found on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, iTunes Podcast, or at any of your favorite podcast platforms. Until next week, Canada, I'm Gino Retta saying so long, hockey fans, and thanks for joining us on the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast.